So before I start, I've decided using my viewfinder that this is gonna be a square composition. Now I definitely advise you, even if your heart is set on a square, to at least experiment with your camera cropping on the photo in a rectangle or looking through your viewfinder. Because whenever I let myself, you know, just try another view, I'm often surprised that I actually like that one better. But I've done that and a square it is. So I'm gonna sketch roughly a square here on my paper. And looking through the viewfinder, I'm gonna say, well, where are my landmarks? So this guy, this little kind of side issue is coming in right about there. And then where else am I cropping? I think I'm gonna crop that top lemon. And these are not you know, exact measurements. I'm just kind of feeling it out. Because once you get some landmarks established, let's say the napkin comes at about, uh, it's a little higher than the halfway point. Marking the halfway points can be helpful. And that's it, I think that's all the cropping I'm gonna do. And so once I've got those landmarks down, I put the viewfinder away because honestly, I don't like drawing with one eye closed. It's about as much fun as trying to read in a moving car. So I just will put that down and use my landmarks to fill in what's happening. And don't think you have to get it perfect right away. Like your canvas is kind of like a dry, dry erase board at this point. You really have a lot of ability to move paint around. It's not like watercolor, you're not locked in. And this does not have to be perfect. The point of this, I mean, drawing practice, okay. But the point of this is to come up with a composition that you can do business with. And also to make some decisions about values. Because here's the thing about composition. It's not really about where you put the lemon on the canvas. It's about the abstract painting, almost like a Rorschach test of the dark, medium, and light shapes that you're putting on that canvas because so the point of a good composition is that it attracts the viewer's attention and then hangs on to it until they hopefully decide that they can't live without it and they have to make it theirs, right? So when someone walks into the gallery from 30 feet away, they can look at your canvas on the wall and before they even know that it's a painting of lemons, they wanna go check it out. Oops, I went outside the line. I make my square bigger. That's my goal, is to make an arrangement of value shapes that is intriguing to the point where I might be able to suck somebody in. Doesn't have to be perfect at this stage. We want to get an idea of the lights and darks. Try to mask the shadows together. It's going to get just a little bit bigger for me here. I have to make sure that stays a square. So it's probably going to get larger over here. All right, that works. What I like about kind of floating that square in the middle of my paper, and even if you have a canvas, you can do this too, is that I'm not rigidly confined by the edges of the canvas like I am, like I will be when I move to the final color piece. I will have to kind of conform to that square. but. At this stage, I'm more free than that. And so I can kind of fudge with it. Like, as long as I can keep it in the square format, I may make a couple changes to those edges. Okay, so I'm just 
blocking in, but I'm finishing now the block in. I've sort of got everything placed. Let me quickly check. This is actually a square. At about eight and a half. And that's about eight and a half. So, all right, I feel safe. And if with this really thin Gamsoli paint, if you don't like something you did, generally you can rub it right out, but we're gonna paint over this immediately. So if you're working on a canvas, oh, you can also use your palette knife to kind of scrape things away, but your paint should be so thin that you can just sort of rub it out with the brush. Just blocking in the outlines, the placement, and starting to look a little bit into your values. I am very soon going to start doing that. I got fruit flies on my lemons, believe it or not. So this is not the kitchen, but there may or may not be like two rotten lemons in my studio garbage can. So that would explain it. August has been a definite lemony month for me. All right, so I see some changes I need to make, but I'm gonna need to make them when I go into my values because I'm starting to not be able to really understand what I'm doing because I have all these gray lines. That's okay. You can go one level darker down into your four if you need to. But you may not need to. Because pretty soon we're going to go. All right. So that's my block in. Now I'm going to start putting on the actual paint. Where am I going to start? I did the block in with three. I'm going to start applying the thick paint with four. Because my dark is dark is easy to diagnose. I don't want to go all the way to five. Five is for really dark accents, the darkest, the very darkest spots. So real quick, I want to talk about loading my brush. Oh, one other thing I have to say is my cameras are DSLRs. And every 25 minutes or so, they shut themselves off because that's what they do when they're recording video. So I hear it, I'll turn them back on right away. One thing I wanna say though about loading a brush before you start painting is our brushes can actually hold a ton more paint than we think they can. And most of us never push the brush to the limit of what it can hold. I see students in workshops a lot, they mix up a really nice big pile of paint like I made, and then you know they pull a little bit out down here, mix the brush back and round in it, back and forth, and they paint, and they come back and they only go into the pile they pulled out. You need to keep going back into the main pile. And yeah, you need to pull it down so the brush can cross hatch back and forth. It's really hard to see in this dark four, isn't it? But the brush can cross hatch back and forth and really get loaded up. You want probably more paint in the brush than you think that you really need. And if it feels a little bit scary, that's probably a good sign. So I'm looking for my darkest darks. Where do I see them? Just taking a minute, even if you don't do this process before you dive into any painting, taking a minute and asking yourself, what's my darkest dark? What's my lightest light? That is crucial to me because you need to maintain that hierarchy and you have to conserve your values, meaning once you find that lightest light, you can't let anything else get up to that point because you're establishing 
that as like a parameter, as a rule for the universe of the painting you're creating. And if you've got a lightest light, that's a that's a specular highlight, that's a, you know, one of those like ding highlights on a white ceramic dish or something, then you better definitely keep an eye on preserving that. Get off my timer. Okay. So yeah, you then you would need to keep all those other like really light areas in your painting that you feel like want to be very, very light. You need to keep them darker because the main limitation of oil paint is that it does not get lighter than titanium white. So if you want something to shine out like a bright highlight, then you absolutely have to keep all your other lights subservient to that. So checking in with your lightest lights before you start your painting is gonna be really helpful to you. Okay, so these are my darkest darks. Cast shadows, that's gonna go all the way to the edge. Do I have any darkest darks back here? Yeah, this is, no, I'm not using black. I'm saving black, just like I was saying about saving white. It's not gonna get any darker than black. Actually, I do kind of see the form shadow on that guy back there being about as dark, and this is also real dark. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do with four. Maybe his form Question. shadow could be four uh, also. Definitely, so I'm painting with three right now. I've moved to three. So, but you're still staining it with Gamsol? No, not really. Maybe like a couple drops if you need it, but you really wouldn't wanna do more than just like touch the corner of the brush into that Gamsol because you, you wanna thicken up. Now, working on this Arches oil paper, like I said, I did put Gamsol on the Arches oil paper before I started painting because it's very dry and frankly, it's papery. I mean, it's, it's paper. And so when I start out working on it, it feels kind of dry, it's sucking the paint in. Canvas shouldn't feel that way. Canvas, now the other thing is, it's true, what you're painting on might be affecting it. So some surfaces that aren't- I usually do canvas panels. Canvas panels, yeah. Like the blicks, uh -huh. a lot of sizes and stuff. Yeah, I think that should be fine. And how much, you know, how hard you're connecting with the canvas. I think some of you would be surprised if you knew how hard I was connecting with the canvas. I mean, not every brush stroke, but brush strokes like these, I'm putting some pressure on the canvas. It's not nothing. It's not just like, like petting the puppy, right? But uh, really the key to stroke economy, that exercise at least, is loading the brush up with a ton of paint. All right, so at this point on the value study, I've got four and three and I'm gonna go to two and see as I'm trying to load that paint, that is feeling a little bit toothpastey. I never wanna feel like I'm painting with toothpaste. I always want it to feel more like, oh, I don't know, mayonnaise. Okay, and so here, as I come over here and I'm squinting, I totally see that the light side of this lemon is the same value as this pink cloth. Oh, I didn't finish his cast shadow there. That's gonna be three. As, as this pink cloth in the light. And the thing about value studies that we're, we're going for this, we want to find areas where the values are the same. And because the colors are all the same, we have beautiful opportunities for lost edges. You want to be losing your drawing a little bit. Don't worry about it. Like just because now I can no longer see this is a lemon and this is a cloth, as long as I've got my still life or my photo reference to be working from, I don't need to worry about losing track of the drawing. I can always go back to the stage where I'm looking at the still life. 
And so my goal in a way is to block in first. That's really light, but I'm gonna give it a two for now because the ground is actually lighter. You know, the, the ground right there is the lightest thing I can see, really. And you know, the other thing that I'm doing to keep this paint flowing and rich is I'm going back to the palette a lot. Like I'm, notice how many times I'm touching the canvas in between trips back to the palette to reload my paintbrush. It's not that many times. And when the paint is gone, I stop, I go back to the palette. And, I, and you can feel it because your stroke will get less rich and satisfying. Oh, I got another sort of opportunity for a lost edge here. This value study is like your hunt for lost edges. Lost edges are when two areas of value come up against each other and they are the same, similar enough that you don't have to paint any line. And not painting those lines is the absolute key to painting loosely. The brain, both yours and your viewer, just adores lost edges. Why? Because it gives them a little puzzle to solve when they're looking at your painting. When you go and look at a photorealist painting, it's certainly very impressive. A lot of talent, skill, and patience is involved in making a painting like that. But maybe you look at it and then you're like, okay, I'm done and you wanna move on to something that's a little more visually challenging. Now I'm gonna move on to one. Okay, so I'm going in a pretty, if that didn't go on the way I wanted it to at first, I'm gonna add a little medium to it, walnut oil or solvent-free gel or even a drop of tube Gamsol, absolutely, and work it back and forth in the paintbrush until I can get it feeling just like I want it to. It's not It can be hard to cover dark paint with lighter paint. You're picking up some of that dark paint that's there. These don't have to be perfect, but if you're if some of that dark paint gets on your brush, just go back to the palette and kind of clean it in the paint, you know? Get some more of that light paint on there. Don't worry too much about being messy. I generally find that these value studies tend to be the most satisfying <laughs> when they're a little bit messy. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it near me, probably on the floor, and I'm going to look at it while I'm doing the color painting. It's a reference for me. And yeah, sometimes I get carried away with these and turn them into like fully finished paintings. But I try not to. I try to use only five values to keep myself from going there. But you know, we all, we love this. We all get carried away sometimes and black and white paintings look really good in frames. I certainly have sold black and white paintings in galleries. I certainly have sold them online. Sarah, what brush are you using? This is the Four Flat and the brand is Princeton. It's the uh, Summit Series White Taclon, synthetic. It is not expensive. I do have some nice rosemary brushes. I, I love their bristle brushes, rosemary, I buy those. But I'm not really in a bristle brush phase right now. I kind of tend to go through these long intense phases where I'll just want to paint with bristle brushes. But I usually don't workshop demo with bristles. I don't quite know why, I guess. Quick painting or simplifying is easier for me with the synthetics. All right, so I'm getting the background mostly established, the, uh, the negative space. I really don't like using the word background because it implies that something is less important. And yeah, we wanna keep the negative space from taking over the scene, taking over attention, but it's not less important. This is 
necessarily. And you do not, if you're painting this plate in my picture, you do not have to get all carried away with like the architecture of this plate like I am. Not in your value study, not in your finished painting. And since one of my goals is to simplify it, thinking about how I can do that while I'm doing the value study, that's a good use of my, my energy here. So now I'm starting to kind of go a little bit back up the value scale, back to three, picking out the distinctions between things. And hopefully what I'm painting is starting to become apparent. Oh. And you know, if you run out of something. You know the recipe, you can make more. Don't just go next door mm -hmm. and get the other one, you know, get the, the next thing, because it's not right. But the goal actually is to run out of paint. So bonus points if you run out of paint. You can brag about it. You can say, oh my gosh, I have to remix. I just have to remix. I need a minute. Okay, I'm gonna to continue to block in this fabric with one and two. So here's where things get kind of tricky. I've got all my kind of middle values established And I need to start doing the highlights. That's one, I'm painting with one now. Lots of one. But not all highlights are created equal. That paint, that points right at this guy. Not all highlights are created equal, so I kind of need to pick and choose my favorites. And ask myself, what's my focal point? There's a couple of pages in your handout about composition, and I do talk about ways to choose a focal point, AKA what is really exciting you about this scene that you're looking at. And for me, and you probably, whatever it is, you know, don't put it up here in the corner. Don't put it like trying to sneak out of the canvas, put it in a sweet spot, rule of thirds, sweet spot. You know, this would be an okay focal point, but probably I'm going for these guys. Is there something about these guys that I particularly like? Well, I really like, I don't know. I really like the way they're nestled together. I like the shapes of their shadows on the plate. I think that's, you know, that's enough. So maybe I'm gonna give them the brightest highlights in the painting. These other lemons have highlights, but see that angle was weird. I can fix that right now. The other lemons have highlights, but you know, I'm, maybe I'm gonna downplay them because those guys are supporting characters. And that's definitely something that I can plan in this value study. And hopefully it will remind me when I go into the final that that was my intention. Setting intentions. That's a lot of what this deal is about, but not being perfect. And the other thing is I might also want to downplay some of the values in my negative space or put like the lightest or the most contrast. Contrast is gonna create a focal point, right? Making something the subject of a painting isn't gonna make it the focal point automatically. I need to create a focal point through the effect, visual effect of contrast. Whether that's gonna be like a complementary color contrast, value contrast is a good one. That's usually a pretty easy one. So that means if I want something to be a supporting character, I better downplay that value contrast. So this lemon back here, this guy, his light side is three, I believe. Yeah, well, what is it, is it three? No, it's two. Hmm. Okay, so maybe I'm gonna split the difference between two and one for this highlight. Good, really 
chilling out back there. And I certainly don't want to get too into what's going on on that guy. That's not a good place for serious detail. Four, that's got a really dark shadow. And yeah. Okay, everything's looking good. But maybe these highlights on the lemons in the plate will be ones. They'll be really bright. And there's a highlight on the plate right here that's kind of picking out that guy's nose. Maybe I'll paint that with one, two. You've got a hierarchy of lights. You need to think about maintaining it. Maybe I'm gonna make that plate two there and not one. So I have saved, now I've got a highlight on him too. Do I really care about this one? Yeah, all right, he can get a little one. Just a simple one. I have not really gone into pure white and I haven't touched my five either. So where are some spots where highlights and dark accents now in the finishing touches are really gonna pop things, okay? So I'll put maybe like a real dark accent between those two on the plate. Where else do I have real dark darks? Here where the, or where the cast shadow of the plate starts. I'll put one like right here here where the cloth goes over. I wanna be putting the strongest contrast near my focal point. And I'm also looking for interesting shadow shapes to play up. I do a value study of some sort, whether it's with the ballpoint pen, Sharpie and white marker, or whether it's on the iPad and Procreate, whether it's a black and white oil painting or even a pencil drawing for just about every painting I make that's larger than, let's say, 12 inches. And a lot of times for my 10 inch paintings, I will. And I mean, you can go back in and refine it, but what we're really trying to do is make decisions about how we're gonna handle things. I mean, I could choose to see this as lighter. I could choose to see it as two coming right up to here and then one behind it. Or I could say, maybe I want less contrast in this corner, I'm out of two. Maybe I want less contrast up there in that corner. So maybe I wanna make the corner value two and just darken that. And I mean, sometimes rather than doing it with paint, which I like to do, but can get messy. Once I have my value study done, I'll pop that into Procreate and mess with it. I'll just make changes to it. Maybe I wanna make that corner too. And so since I see this cloth as being darker then the cloth becomes three right there into two. And that kind of gives a little more value shift in the negative space, which makes it more interesting. So it's a decision-making process for sure. Anybody have any questions? I'm gonna put on a couple of highlights with my pure white because I saved my pure white for last. I can do that now and then we'll be done. Oh, there's a really light highlight here. If I can get that to show up. I can experiment with that. Yeah, it shows up. It's different enough than one. So like I said, I can refine this until the cows come home, but I think I've got the information that I came for. I've established my composition. I've also shown myself something which is sort of a tough one that um, the lightest part of this plate. So 
people find plates really tricky and I don't blame them. And the thing is like a plate is going to have a light side and a shadow side, just like any other object is. And it gives it a lot of depth to show it that way. The plate rim as it goes around is a little bit darker back toward the light source. Sure, it's got this highlight right here, but it, the lightest part of the plate rim is actually right there. So being able to gather that information is sort of helpful to me. I don't really like what I did right there. Okay. So now I can, now I, I would maybe take a picture of this with my phone and then maybe I would go out of the studio for a while, have a snack, drink some water, look at it on my phone away from the still life. And also looking at it on your phone is the equivalent of getting really far away from it because it's so small. So that's helpful. And then you ask yourself, do I really like this? Do I really like this? <laughs> 